Good afternoon. Welcome to the Preservation Association of Lincoln Brown Bag Lecture Series. My name is Eileen Burke, and I'm the coordinator of these brown bags. Our lecture today is sponsored by the Preservation Association of Lincoln. These brown bags are supported by your membership in Pre the Preservation Association of Lincoln. We encourage you to join to support these activities. To join, please go online to preservelincoln.org. Our speaker today is Joyce Coppinger. Joyce's interest in bale building started in 1996 when she learned that this building method and its historic connection to Nebraska. In 1997, she started a consulting business and organized the first workshop in Nebraska on the design and construction of straw bale buildings. In 1998, she founded the Straw Bale Association of Nebraska and organized an international conference in Halsey, Nebraska in 2000. Uh, Joyce began managing uh, editor, publisher of The Last Straw, the International Journal on Straw Bale and Natural Building in 2003. She has been involved in one way or another in 40 new straw bale building projects in Nebraska and has taught and worked in Kansas, Iowa, and South Dakota. She has been teaching a six-hour seminar on straw bale buildings at SCC in Lincoln for a number of years. Through the years, she traveled to conferences in Australia, United, the United Kingdom, Northern Europe, Canada, and many parts of the US, U.S. Please join me in welcoming Joyce. Her topic today is Historic Bale Buildings of Nebraska. Thank you, Eileen. <clears throat> I'm very glad to be here today to share with you uh, a bit of the history of bale building in Nebraska. <clears throat> um, as I travel around the world, I get a really good reception because so much of the publications that have come out um, in the last few years about straw bale building mention the Nebraska style straw bale, which um, is based on the research that Mott's Merriman, Judy Knox, David Eisenberg, and a few other people did in um, the late 1980s that started the revival uh, in throughout the United States. And that pushed the revival, they also pushed the revival, which is now worldwide. There is no country in the world that we know of that does not have some sort of interest in straw bale or has already done straw bale. Uh, for example, Mongolia has 500 straw bale buildings. Um, and there's, um, as I said, there's 40 new ones in, in Nebraska since I've been working in straw bale in 97. Um, there are some close by that you can see um, if you want to have an experience of actually being inside one of the buildings and feel what that's like because it is a little different than other buildings. Um, the walls are very thick. They're 14, 16, 18 inches thick. And it gives a nice, quiet, comfortable feel to a building. We also try to build so that there's a connection between the outside nature and the design of what we do on the inside. So there's that natural connection with nature, both inside and outside. Um, Roger Welch started doing research about the, the um, sod houses in Nebraska. And in the process, he learned from people, uh, mostly in the sand hills, that there had been hay bale buildings built also. And that method that they, the pioneers in the sand hills used was a load-bearing method where the bales were stacked in money bond courses, held together, pinned together with uh, some sort of uh, twigs or uh, branches, and then had a very simple roof on top. And I'll show you some of the later versions of those buildings in the, in the presentation today. Um, there, there are other countries that also had buildings uh, made of hay bales at about this same time. Right now in France, they're trying to save a building that was built in 1921. In Australia, there were, was bale building in the, in the state of Victoria and also in South Australia in the 1930s. And we can identify buildings uh, in South Dakota, North Dakota, Wyoming, as well as Nebraska 
from the 1880s to 1945. The oldest one in Nebraska that I'm aware of is a schoolhouse building in Scottsbluff County. Unfortunately, it's not in my presentation today because I don't have any photographs of it, but I'm working on that. And um, up to 1945, the Lone Oak building was the last one built in that early revival. And the Lone Oak, as you may know, um, is the hay bale building out on West um, O Street, uh, Highway 6 and they're now in the process of tearing that building down. And um, on the table I have a, um, a piece of the outer coating and also some hay from one of the bales in that building. So there still is a little chance to see it if you want to drive by. Um, I'm going to start out with the next oldest known building. And th that's two buildings that appeared on Fawn Lake Ranch. Uh, during the time period 1899 to 1914. These are um, a headquarters building and a bunkhouse for the Fawn Lake Ranch. The Fawn Lake Ranch is uh, um, in between the two highways going north and south, uh, and Hyannis is the closest town. Um, and I'm told it's like 24 miles into, into the ranch to find these buildings. Um, they were visited by Mott's and Judy when they were doing their research, and um, they, were, they were very pleased with the design of these buildings, and they're some of the buildings that they learned from as they helped uh, describe and tell the rest of us how they were built and to develop the techniques and methods. Um, unfortunately, these buildings were turned down in about 2010, the year 2010, and replaced with a manufactured home. Um, I was also told that, in addition, there was, uh, on this same ranch, a ranch house which also was constructed using bales. Um, before the, these buildings were torn down, I had made contact with uh, Ted Turner's foundation through my foundation, the Green Prairie Foundation for Sustainability, and had communicated that there was, these were historic buildings in the state and we would like to preserve them if, if at all possible. And after a lot of telephone conversations back and forth with his various aides, I was given permission to go to the ranch to view these and to photograph them so that I could do an article in the last straw so that people around the world would know what was happening with them. Unfortunately, I got a phone call from the neighboring rancher one day out of the blue, and he told me that the, brand, that the buildings had been torn down and they were replaced with this manufactured house that was uh, a space for ranch hands to live in. And my initial reaction, uh, and the newspaper called me and asked what I was going to say about it, and my initial reaction was uh, a bit of anger, I must admit. Um, but um, I guess I realized that this is the property of the person that owns it. And if there, if there is not, we don't know what the condition of the buildings were. So there may have been a reason why they tore them down. Uh, the assumption is the buildings weren't suitable for current day purposes or that they could have been in poor condition as the Lone Oak has been known to be. So. Sometimes we lose a good building. Sometimes we can save them. Um, this Burke, the Burke House on the Burke Ranch uh, near Alliance is one of the older buildings, and it's been called the oldest existing building. But unfortunately, in the last couple of years, the words come to me that a wall or some part of a wall, and I believe it to be... Um, this corner wall right here uh, has collapsed, and I don't know how much of the building is standing. Um, I had called Mr. Burke uh, several years ago and um, asked him if I could come out to the ranch, and he was very generous in saying that I could visit. But by the time I was ready to go out, I had learned that he was very ill, and when I called back to make an appointment, uh, he had passed away. So unfortunately, I have not been to this ranch, but I'm trying to make arrangements for people from around the world who are attending an international conference this fall um, in Colorado to perhaps go to this ranch and to the buildings in Arthur 
and uh, one other building in um, Alliance so that they will see. And Mott's Merriman is coming through Nebraska um, sometime this year. And I've asked him if he'll go back to these buildings and gather what information he can and then share it with us all. We get very attached to these houses. I feel like I should be the steward of all these buildings and if one of them is in dire need, I feel like it's my responsibility to take care of it, even though they aren't my buildings, but I get very attached. Uh, the building of this uh, Burke House was said to have never been plastered and over the years withstood all the Nebraska's weather, uh, whatever that might bring, the snow, the blizzards, the rains, the tornadoes, whatever. This is the Sturts house on their ranch, 10 miles north of Stapleton. And fortunately, I did visit this ranch. Um, when I went to see Jim Sturts in Stapleton, he was very generous and took me out to the ranch. And uh, when we got there, he started to kind of get very um, emotional about the building. And I asked him, um, if he'd explain his connection to the building, and he actually was born in this building and had lived there continuously since till 1998 when he took ill and he and his wife moved to town. And then the building uh, was lived in by various ranch hands for a while and then was also abandoned. Uh, if you know about the, it was built in 1905 by local craftsmen and the Sturts family has had it from the very beginning. Um, the, bail the bail walls were covered on the interior with paneling. He was very proud to tell me that he had done that work, except for the north bedroom, and that's the only place in the building where you could actually see the curvature of the bales in the, <coughs> beneath the stucco. The home had a living room, a, a kitchen and a dining room, a bathroom and two bedroom spaces. Years later, they added a porch to the back of it and um, unfortunately there was water damage visible between the porch and the house and that caused me some concern. But I found out later that, that I should have been more concerned about the roof because um, the Sturts family, <clears throat> I was at a conference in western Nebraska about ag tourism years ago and uh, this woman came racing up to me I had a booth there and, and uh, had been talking to people about straw bale. And she came racing up to me at lunch and said that she was the Sturt's daughter and that they were trying to renovate the building using historic pre preservation guidelines and wanted to use it as a bed and breakfast operated as a ag ec uh, eco tourism uh, effort. And they had already started to replace the roof and um, we're right, quite excited about the whole venture. Then um, I heard from her a couple of years later and they had decided that the cost of renovation was too great. So they were gonna restore the house as much as they could and just maintain it for the family. <clears throat> when I went out there with Jim, we drove about a mile, mile and a half out into the ranch <clears throat> and he explained to me as we were going along that throughout the sand hills there were these various water tables and that from time to time uh, ponds would develop as depending on the amount of rain that they'd had. So as we got in front of the building, there was a big dike that was constructed in front of the building and we had to drive across that uh, to get to the house and it was, it was only a few feet in front of the house. Um, one of the reasons I was interested in seeing it was at the time I was looking for a place to rent for uh, an office living space in western Nebraska so that I had a place to stay when I worked out there. And after I saw the water and the conditions of how I would get in and out of the ranch to go there, I think I changed my mind quite quickly. So another dream busted. <laughs> This is the Simonton Ranch um, house built around 1908. It's probably one of the most famous Nebraska houses because it was used on the cover of Mott's Merriman and Steve McDonald's book called Build It With Bales Version 2. And it's been published in a lot of other books and, and I see it quite frequently on the internet. <clears throat> For this building, um, 
It's located in Purdom, and Purdom is 14 miles north of the highway out of Halsey. And I went out there um, so that I could visit the building at about the same time that I uh, was involved with organizing the second Nebraska Straw Bale Conference. Uh, in the no early 1990s, Mott's Merman, Judy Knox, and this original group um, had, had a conference at um, Arthur, Nebraska, where they um, talked about hay bale building and uh, discussed the techniques and the methods and then started to plan a research process to test buildings for fire and moisture and other factors um, that would relate to construction. Uh, Judy Knox was uh, a microenterprise um, developer and had worked in a lot of different countries and her concern was that primarily women needed to build housing for themselves in various countries and didn't really have the skills to do that. So she was looking for a building method that was simple and easy that could be built with materials that they had at hand. And when I teach, that's what I teach people. We need to build with what we have at hand. If we ship materials in from all over the world to build with, we add a lot of cost to that. and. Uh, there are materials that are readily available here to us that we could be using that would reduce the embodied energy and the cost of the house and would give us a structure that was related to where we are and to the sense of place that we have here and would also be a resource uh, economically for, for people. Mott's Merriman uh, had a background in geology and the t their, their interests kind of combined into finding this simpler building material that lots of people could build with. And at the moment, uh, there are straw bale builders trying to um, develop techniques that can be used in a lot of different parts of the country and, ar and around the world. Um, there's a, a woman engineer from Nevada who's been working in Pakistan uh, there's a woman um, who was in the diplomatic corps uh, for the United States and was stationed in Afghanistan and started to work with the people in Afghanistan to help them uh, rebuild and to develop housing. Um, when the, when the um, earthquakes happened in, um, in Haiti, a group of people went to Haiti to build. So um, there are... Um, non-governmental agencies all over the world that are involved with trying to find easy ways to build. Um, there was one in China where um, they asked uh, build a, an architect from Washington State to work with this NGO to build housing in China. What they'd been doing was using coal for heating and uh, cooking and they used it in the schools as well as their homes and the children were dying from the toxics from the coal. And if they built with the bale building, the R value, the R, R30 value that we estimate is an average, be, depending on design and construction, was um, a way for them to get away from having to have that, that heating material within their homes. So they have many, many buildings uh, in Mongolia and China, as I said. Um, these days to help them solve that problem. When I um, sponsored the, when the Straw Bale Association of Nebraska sponsored the conference in Halsey, uh, we had 100 some people at that conference from 15 states in the United States, uh, a delegation from Australia, um, and also a United Nations delegation of Mongolian engineers who, um, were wonderful to work with and quite knowledgeable and uh, very articulate one of them one of the engineers actually spoke to us at the conference and then they went back and built um, lots of homes there so um, we've participated in a lot of different ways around the world um, when I wanted to go see this Purdom house I had I had the name of Simonton but I didn't have any other contacts so when I travel in western Nebraska or any place, um, I always go to a post office. Unfortunately, a post office may not be around forever, but that was always my point of contact to find out where people live. So when I went to Purdom, I drove out there on a beautiful summer day, and um, 
before I got there, there was a sign that said, Purdom, next three exits. It turned out it was three people's houses along the way. And when I got into town, there were about five buildings, including these three houses in the whole town. So I went to the post office, and that postmistress was talking to a woman. And when I came in, they stopped their conversation, and the woman went out the door. The postmistress said to me, and could I help you? And I said, yes, I'm looking for Mrs. Simonton. And she said, you better run. She just walked out the door. So I caught her just before she drove away, and she generously took me to the ranch, and we took the rancher's road, if you know what that means. Uh, they just go cross country wherever you are. And uh, we got to this little house that you see here at the bottom. And uh, she drove up in front of it, and I parked next to her, and I got out, and she said to me, and why did you want to see this house? And I said, it's a hay bale house, and I do straw bale design and construction, and I'm interested in learning more about it. And she said, well, it used to be a hay bale house. Several years ago, they took all the bales out of the building and covered it with asbestos siding for their insulation. So when I got over the shock of it, she took me up to her house, which was a manufactured house, uh, just a few feet away. And she dug into the, into the closet, brought out all of this historic information, and shared with me how this building had been constructed. Unfortunately, I don't have any of that. And when I went back to see her when she was living in Halsey, she asked me to leave the place, so I left. And thanks to um, David Murphy at the Nebraska Historical Society, in his article that he wrote in um, the magazine for the Historical Society about the Lone Oak, he also included this photograph of the grief house out by Thedford. And it, the, the caption on the photograph reads, the McGreef house north of Thedford, Nebraska, unlike the Lone Oak, Bales in early buildings usually were stacked in running barn courses. Each course covers the joints of the course below. Vertical cuts from the baler indicate that the bales of this house are set so the straw is or oriented horizontally. And that's basically the technique used for load-bearing Nebraska style. And notice the pitch of this roof, and that's not unusual for a lot of the buildings that were built in this particular time. Uh, I'm also told that when they uh, built with bales, um, they, they needed to compress the bales so that their, the wall would be solid. So they would go out and harvest whatever they were going to use. It could be prairie meadow hay, it could be cattails, the cattail uh, leaves. And it, could, it was even reeds sometimes. And I'm also told it could have been Sudan grass. And they would bale this up and then prepare their walls and um, let, let the house sit for a month or so when they went and did other chores around the ranch. And then they would come back to it and the bales would have settled. Now, in my experience with load bearing, most people tell me that if they actually do pre-compression on their wall before they put the roof on in a load bearing situation, that the bales, we tie it down um, with a cable or a, a strapping and put pressure on it, uh, so like a come along or a, a turnbuckle. And uh, repeatedly do that as uh, these, these sections are strapped down. We go back and measure the wall and then let time pass and then go back and measure the wall again until there is no more settling. And normally that settling isn't more than an inch or two because the bales uh, that we use are usually 50 to 75 pounds and they stack on top of each other so they're going to compress each other anyway. And all we're really doing is doing a final compression of that top one or two bales and most of the other compression of the wall has already taken place. So it's a minimal amount of compression with the methods that we do now. Then we already have the top plate on, so we just put the roof on after that, and the bale wall is, is ready to go to be plastered. Um, another building that I've not been able to see is uh, 
at the Becker Ranch near Ashby. Um, and I'm told by um, John Adam, who lives in Alliance and whose cousin owns this ranch now, that there is a ranch house there that's been occupied by the ranch manager and his family. And it was built somewhere between 1915 and 1920 using hay bales. And it sits on footings with a, uh, with a stuccoed exterior. Um, I tried to go there, but at the time I didn't have a four-wheel drive vehicle. And um, unfortunately, I've never been out there, but he's making contact. I just talked to him a week or so ago, and he's making contact, and hopefully uh, we'll get it set up so that maybe sometime this year we can visit that ranch too. This is one of the more famous buildings um, because it's, it's also published in uh, the photographs of it are, are published in a lot of the periodicals and on, it's on the internet. It's the Martin Monhart House in Arthur. Um, Arthur is in Arthur County in the Sand Hills. I think there's 814 people total that live in the entire county, which is 25 miles square, if I'm right. Um, it, these three photographs show the, the original building at the top uh, right and then uh, a later picture at the bottom left, and as it basically is today um, on the bottom right. The building was built in 1928. Uh, when it was built, there was no basement underneath it. When I went to see um, the building uh, a few years ago, uh, Jake Cross, his wife uh, Lucille, and he own the building now, and her family, the Monhart family, owned it uh, and still do. Uh, the house didn't have a basement, so uh, they had some difficulties with uh, the uh, faucet in the kitchen, so they decided they needed to dig a basement, so they hand dug a basement for this house. And um, he took me down to the basement and showed me the concrete bond foundation that sits in that sandy soil and um, was quite proud of the fact that they dug this basement out for the access. But uh, the last trip I made to Arthur, I discovered that the entire house was surrounded by this wide concrete, um, almost like a bunker. And I assumed that maybe that was a barrier um, so that the walls wouldn't cave in or that the sand around the building wouldn't cave in uh, to the basement structure. I have a call in to Jake and Lucille about the tour we're planning for this fall, so um, I'll try to get more information about that and um, share it with people in the future. This is another of the famous historic Nebraska buildings. This is Pilgrim Holiness Church. It's only a couple blocks south of the Martin Monarch House in Arthur, Nebraska, and built probably about the same time, 1928 or so. The building now houses the Arthur County Historical Society Museum. And uh, I've visited it several times, um, and it seems to be in pretty good condition because the community has taken good care of it, especially Ted Fry, who unfortunately is no longer with us, but had great pride in taking care of all the historic buildings in that small little town. Um, the building originally did not have this um, entrance at the front, the little vestibule. They added that on later. And you can see from the side that there's another little uh, portion of the building there, and that's actually um, the living quarters for the pastor. And there's a stairway up out of that part that goes into the, <clears throat> the second story of the building, and that's living quarters for the family. Uh, this building also sits on a concrete bomb, bomb um, sorry, concrete beam with no basement. And um, uh, it was renovated in 1976 as the town's U.S. Bicent bicentennial uh, celebration. And Ted put on a new roof about five years ago. <clears throat> in all of the straw bale buildings, we try to put 
a truth window. Mott's Merriment gave it that name. What happens when we build with bales is we can see the bales until we get the plaster on it, and then when people come to your home and you tell them it's a straw bale house, they can't see the bales anymore. So they doubt you <laughs> for some reason. So the truth window in the, in the um, Pilgrim Holiness Church allows people to see the original gumbo mud, that lovely sticky gumbo mud that you can find in the sand hills. Um, I'm told by a woman near Crookston that, that built a straw bale house that I went to see one time, that there is a gumbo mud pit down by the Niobrara River on their ranch, and she said she and her friends go down there and have mud baths, so that should be an interesting experience. Um, the church was coated with concrete plaster, and uh, that concrete plaster was repeated for every renovation. Um, when I went there, I was really amazed when we walked in because this building had a sloped floor in it. And I thought that was really unique that a building from that time period was, they thought, to put a, a, a sloped floor in it. <clears throat> but um, it's pretty much paneled, so you can see that it's a, con a, a hay bale building on the outside just from the bumpiness of the walls. But. Um, I've been trying ever since I became involved with Straw Bale to work with the people that are the owners of all of these buildings to encourage them um, to let people that have experience in doing the plaster and doing the repair work to come in and rejuvenate their buildings. But uh, there's quite a bit of resistance toward that, so we haven't done uh, much renovation at all. And I've also contacted all of the owners and given them information about how to list on the county, state, and national registries of historic places so that they'll have some record and, and preserve those buildings as they were originally built. That also was not an easy thing to do. Um, some people have reacted, but I, I, I don't think that most of the buildings are listed. In fact, I've had difficulty gathering information about the buildings so that we can list them on the International Straw Bale Registry um, that's available on the internet. <clears throat> it's something that was started uh, by Mott's and Judy and some, and some other early bail builders as a way to post information about wh how various buildings were constructed and to sh gather information about mortgage lending and uh, insurance and to have a list of houses that people could go visit uh, so that they have that experience of, of what it was like to live in a building and also to learn from the owners how to build it and how to design it. <clears throat> I keep working on this project, so we'll see, hopefully, maybe someday we'll get more people listed. And I have to switch to another. This next group of houses um, and structures are um, in the 30s and 40s. The Scott House um, has been owned by the same family since it was built in 1936. It's on one of those wonderful sticky gumbo roads in the Sand Hills. Um, it was built uh, by that family um, and the current owner plans to retire there. Um, I visited a couple of times, and um, this is a little blurry, I'm sorry. Um, this is a really nice little house. It's um, um, up on, um, a ba it has a basement, which is the only basement we know of in the state of Nebraska in a, in a hay bale house. <clears throat> It's a daylight basement. There are windows in the basement. And when I went down to the basement and looked up to the framing, you could actually see the hay um, 
in the walls. Uh, it had been painted so you could see the strands. You can actually see the hay itself. Um, <clears throat> at some point, <coughs> they needed to replace the windows and got a deal on non-operational windows. So they put in windows that you couldn't open and close. And that became a problem because it kept the humidity into the building and there was no way to cool it, even though a building, a uh, veil building with its thick walls will stay 60 to 75 degrees year round, which is one of the benefits of having a, a straw bale house. <clears throat> so they did uh, actually take these, some of the windows out and replace them with oper operable windows, but there were still some of the stationary windows in it. And uh, at one point <clears throat> in the basement, there's storage and a sleeping room but they also had a wood-burning stove and one of the renters tried to attach that so that it, they would have more heat in the house, but I never quite understood why that was necessary because the houses stay so warm in the wintertime. Um, this is just two more views of the house. And notice that most of these houses uh, were small square buildings, uh, a very efficient way to build and they had um, hip roofs, meaning that the roof came down and sat with a, a rib on all four corners. And uh, I still encourage people to build with a hip roof because it really is a strong roof and endures um, a lot of weather conditions. This is the Haslow House in Alliance, Nebraska. Um, I visited there but, and took pictures, but I wasn't able to go in. The family wasn't there. Uh, this is one of the buildings we want to include in the tour this fall. And so I'm trying to get in touch with the family. The same family lives in this house since it was built. It's actually on the Boy Scout Ranch south of Alliance. I don't have too much information on the building. Um, a gentleman called me uh, who was coming through Nebraska from the East Coast headed to the West Coast. And I did make arrangements for him to go out there and his only comment was that uh, the house smelled very musty and, and thought maybe there was moldu, uh, mildew or mold in the building. So um, when I talk to the family, we'll see if that's a problem and maybe we can help them with that. But, and hopefully we'll get to have an opportunity to go inside the building. Um, this is one of my favorite historical Bale stories. Um, when I was touring Nebraska and trying to find all these different buildings, I went out to Sutherland and went to the public library and asked if they had any information on Harry Hiles's bale, uh, hay bale airplane hangers. And this librarian kind of grinned at me and went to the file and pulled out this little brochure. This is a copy of a copy of a copy, which is why the photograph is unclear, but basically Harry Hiles was a um, uh, pilot in the 20s, a barnstorming pilot, and he wanted to have a place where people could bring their planes so that they could be stored and worked on. So he developed these round buildings. This is his Model 100, which was only one story tall, and a um, hundred feet, and they could take the, these planes into the building, store them, work on them, and then be able to bring them out and fly them right off the, uh, the ground. Um, they were built of concrete, laced with steel, and filled with bales and covered with concrete plaster. This is model 200. It had a balcony. Where, and it had a, a hydraulic lift so that the planes could be lifted into the second story. And I called the family to get more information about it, and the woman that I talked with didn't have much information about the buildings except themselves except to say they were no longer in existence, which really upset me. But um, she did tell me about Harry, and the thing she told me was that in addition to being a barnstorming pilot, he was also an owner, owner of racehorses. And he had one particular racehorse that was a black horse that won all the races in any race that he was entered in. So at some point, they banned this horse from the racetracks because nobody else's horses could win. 
for a number of years, other people were racing their horses and they were having good success. But one day a white horse showed up and won the race again. And the horse got rather heated up in the course of the race and when they took him back to the barn, it turns out that he wasn't a white horse, he was a painted white horse, and it was the same black horse that won all the races. And when I heard that, I said, I wish I had met Harry Hiles. I think I would have liked him. <laughs> um, this is a, just is a picture in Wyoming that I added um, because it's a mortared bale building, which is similar to the Lone Oak building that I'll show you in a minute. But... Um, this house was built in the 40s, and it's mortared bale, and the window box are inset, as we do with uh, load-bearing construction, as the bales are stacked. And then this happens to have a gable roof with trusses. And this is a, another photograph of the house completed. And um, this is the Lone Oak Restaurant building built around 1945 by the family that had the restaurant. And uh, I was told that this might have been the place where the recipe for Thousand Island dressing was developed. Have you ever heard that, Ed? No? I've heard it, but I not believed it. You don't believe it? <laughs> I tasted it, and I wanted to believe it. <laughs> um, and also, um, it was the first place I ever had a lobster, so that was exciting for me. Uh, years later, it was the Elms restaurant and bar, and then it became uh, El Ranchito, a Mexican restaurant in its latest uh, incarnation. Uh, now, <clears throat> for many years, it stood uh, pretty much abandoned, perhaps with no electricity, no heating, uh, no plumbing, and used primarily for storage. And um, although the building had the, ro the roof, flat roof replaced at least once, um, there was water damage to the building, so there was mold and mildew inside. Um, when I did the first of three straw bale tours that I did um, uh, when I first got started in, in this um, adventure, um, I got in touch with a real estate agent that was trying to sell this property and he graciously allowed us to go out there and tour the facility, not inside, just on the outside. And um, years later, a guy from Arizona called me up and said he was going to be in town and he wondered if I could show him the buildings that we have. So um, I got it, I, we went at, out to the Lone Oak, and uh, this was in its um, stage where the parking lot was filled with um, cars and trucks, and um, there were feral cats all over the place, and there were black dogs chained to truck bent bumpers, and um, so I told this man it was private property and we really shouldn't go on it, but we didn't see anybody around, so we thought we'll just tiptoe out there, take a couple pictures, and then we'll tiptoe right back. And we were standing in front of the entry area, and he and I were standing side by side, and he was taking pictures. And I suddenly felt this presence behind me. And I heard this voice say, is there something I could do for you? And I said, without turning around, uh, we're just taking pictures. We'll be out here right away. I'm sorry we came on the property. And it'll just be five minutes if that's okay. He, okay, he said. So I'm, this man finished his photographs and we left the property. And in the paper, about three days later, I read that the place was under police, police surveillance. <laughs> so I guess we were lucky to get out of there. So I didn't do that very often after that. And if people asked me, we just stayed on the road and they took pictures from the road. So, um, the first floor of this building uh, housed the restaurant and the kitchen, and the second story of the building was used as a dance floor. And I uh, used to take somewhat of a 
note of pride in the fact that this load-bearing bale wall building could support a live load such as that for a dance. Um, but then after I read David Murphy's article, I realized that the concrete mortar between the bales um, may have given the walls the strength that it needed in order to endure, uh, but I'm not sure about that fact. Uh, the bales, this shows the bales as the, the whole building it was, as it was designed with the bales uh, mortared in above the windows. Um, and if you go out there now and see, um, you can see the hay bales up above in the, in the upper part of the building and the concrete in the lower part. Um, there's a, a friend of mine who lives in um, the Netherlands. And he came up with uh, a method to mortar bales also, which some people around the world do use. It's called the French dip method. And actually what he does is take a bale and he has a vat in which he mixes up a thin slip um, of earth and plaster. And he dips the bales into this plaster and then lifts that bale up onto the wall and stacks it in running barn courses. And it's, a, it's the intent of that is to hold the bales in place uh, rather than pinning them or staking them as, as we do in some methods. And that uh, he prefers that method so that he thinks it moves better and, and it holds the bale wall together without additional pinning. Um, this is the exterior of the building in one of those times when it was not used as the restaurant. <clears throat> and at this particular time, um, one of the owners cleared the parking lot of all those semi-trailer trucks and chain dogs and feral cats and did a renovation which was supposed to, I hope, have been done by some historic building standards since it had been listed on the Lancaster County Register, but uh, basically all they did was replace um, some concrete blocks in the corners. Like you can see here in this photograph over on the right hand side, there was a lot of water damage to the building. So there's still cracks in, that, in those same corners. So I'm not sure exactly what they did, but. Um, and uh, I'm told that there were bales used as insulation in the floor ceiling portion of the building also. And, and uh, because the building fell in disrepair, um, it's probably uh, better that it's not being used for any other purpose now, but it's sad to see it go. Um, and I did talk to the owner and um, explain that we'd like to have some portion of it retained if possible, but um, I don't think that's going to happen, so. Uh, this is the Lone Oak um, out in front of the building as, as it was originally built uh, and for which the building was named. And this um, is a, just a little building out at Dobby Lee's uh, Frontier Village in the northeast corner of Alliance. He has a whole village there, a frontier village that he's recreated on his property. And kids from the community have helped him build it as well as other people in the community. And um, he wanted to build a load-bearing straw bale building similar in size and design to what the pioneers would have used. So he, this is what he actually has on the property. I haven't been out there for a while, so I don't know what condition it's in. It's actually two rooms, and you have to kind of duck to get in because he... The pioneers weren't as tall as we are. <laughs> and um, <clears throat> at the time I was there, I noticed in the other room that there was black plastic all over the floor and there was corn on top of it. And I said to Dobby, who used to be the mayor of Alliance, um, what's going on in that room? And he said, oh, the corn's fermenting. And I said, and what will it be used for? And he said, well, when we go to the next building, I'll give you a sample. It was, he was making a little corn liquor. He also had a little elderberry wine there. <laughs> um, they built this over, he and his wife Corley, um, built this over a long period of time. And um, it's, it's just an interesting place to visit. I don't know if, 
it's if it's still there or not. Um, I haven't been out there to tell. Um, that's my presentation for today. If you have any questions, I'll be glad to try to answer them for you. Um, I do teach a seminar at Southeast Community College. Uh, it's a six-hour seminar on um, all aspects of uh, hay bale and straw bale design. And the next one is on May 5th, and I'll do another one on July 14th, and then one in September or October as well. And um, no questions? She's gone. Yeah. Yes. Um, is it possible that these old buildings can be retained through some sort of method of, of preservation or something? We can do the work to restore them. Could, could like the Lone Oak have been restored? Um, in that particular case, I think it would have been a very costly thing. Um, my dream was that I would be able to buy the building and make it into a museum. But the cost of the building at the time I looked at it, and pretty consistently over the times it was available for sale, was around $100,000, which I didn't have. And I know that I probably could have raised the money through the Straw Bale community internationally. Um, but it probably would have taken twice that to restore it and make it into a viable building. So uh, it was just not something that I could afford to do. And uh, the Straw Bale Association of Nebraska would have taken it on as a project. But it just didn't happen. So I, I wish it had. Have you learned enough through your research so the buildings built now, like, you know, the Rose Sanctuary and mm -hmm. the Spring Creek Prairie buildings and those are going to last longer with less problems? Well, we have, there, there are codes that we follow now. Um, there's, they're working right now to get uh, straw bale into the International Building Code. We work with people around the world on their codes and they share information about their problems and we try to work those out. That's why we have the international conferences because we share information about different conditions on uh, whatever climate they live in or whatever materials they have at hand to build with. Um, we've progressed to a stage where we not only do load bearing, which I don't prefer, but we also do post and beam. My favorite method is bo called the box column method. And I like that because it's easy method to build and I think it's simple in design and can pass code quite quickly. And there are also people developing panel wall systems like a structural insulated SIP that they use in conventional construction. So um, there's a lot of changes occurring, uh, not just in the United States, but a lot of innovation going on in other countries around the world. The Australians have their own, um, uh, it's a Australia, New Zealand professional association. Uh, we have the Colorado, Colorado Straw Bale Association that's hosting the international conference, the California Straw Bale that hosted a conference, the Nebraska Straw Bale Association that hosted a conference. And there's a Northeastern group also. Uh, there's a hay bale building in um, Mississippi, I think it is, uh, that was built early on that's still in existence. It's a museum. Uh, so we know the buildings are durable and we're trying to blend the old building methods and techniques to modern conventional methods and techniques and a lot of people are focused on mainstreaming the building so that it can be viable commercially. So we have all kinds of buildings. We have homes, small owner built homes. We have uh, very big, unfortunately, <laughs> McMansions built out of straw. Um, and we have a lot of different kinds of commercial buildings as well. So. Um, I think it's viable, I think it's adaptable, and um, I think it's a really good method because it's as natural as we can get it in most cases. Some people have taken it beyond that. We don't have to do a lot of heating and air conditioning. It can just be a simple system. 
Um, I teach natural ventilation to everybody I can talk to so that they understand about uh, humidity and airflow and air circulation and expelling the humidity out of the building and maintaining uh, a good balance between the exterior and the interior. So I think we're making progress. I, I hope that we don't get to the point where we've over-designed it and we've lost some of the appeal of it. But beyond that, um, I think we can, we do well. Here in Lincoln, uh, we have Codes Approved House in town. And in Lancaster County, we have the Prairie Hill Montessori School. And at Denton, there's the um, Spring Creek Prairie Center, uh, their nature center. And uh, the Audubon Row Sanctuary um, is also a, a straw bale building. There's um, a saloon up at Spencer. If you want a nice drive on a nice Sunday afternoon, you can drive up to Spencer. And it's right along the Nibera River at the Spencer Dam. Um, and that's a family that built this building um, to replace a building that had blown down in a tornado. Uh, there's a couple of buildings, uh, cabins up at Ponca. Uh, there's a straw bale house in uh, Ralston, Nebraska that's codes approved. Um, there's buildings all over. There's the um, Vinegar Factory in Cody. Uh, that's one of the newer buildings. And um, houses dotted all over the state. Um, thank you. Thank you very much.